Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Morning and welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. I am your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my genuinely amazing guest, we bring you inspiring and actionable insights to take your life and your business to the next level. Ranked in the top 2% globally, this podcast really is a must listen. Again, it's because of my guest. So whether you're tuning in for entrepreneurial tips, career advice, or personal development strategies, get ready to turn inspiration into action, challenges into triumphs, and dreams into reality. And our topic today with my returning guest, Steve Cockrum, is about the communication code. Steve is joining me today from London, and I'm always delighted to have the opportunity to speak with him. So Steve is the co-founder of Giant Worldwide. He's a renowned speaker, an entrepreneur, and advisor to global leaders. And together with Jeremy Kubitschek, he has authored many impactful books, and I have most of them in my my library here, like the one 100x leader, 100 times leaders, five voices and five gears, and their latest, Cracking the Communication Code, is very much a part of my entrepreneurial library. And this book, and this is why I wanted to talk with him about this, this book highlights the keys to strong personal and professional relationships, effective two-way communication, which is really what it's all about. If you can't communicate, you're not going to get very far very quickly. It introduces five crucial conversation codes, celebrate, care, clarify, collaborate, and critique. So Steve, welcome. It's so good to have you back. Thank you, Denise. What what an honor. I, I still struggle with my American introductions, but uh, thank you for those kind words and uh, honored to be on such a, a globally recognized podcast with you. But thanks for having me. It's globally recognized because of people like you. Seriously, this is not about me. I am here to facilitate a conversation, let people get to know you and hopefully read your books and learn. So before I kind of start bombarding you with questions i have the book in front of me i've got little sticky notes all over it it's 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 been used but anyway tell people a bit about yourself that maybe i missed yeah okay so um i have been married to helen for 31 years now we have three daughters who are 23 20 and 12 a very unexpected blessing in our old age and uh I am one of the the most blessed men you'll meet in the sense that um, I I am loved with an incredible family and a network of friends and colleagues that work here. And I would say that basically um, if true wealth is measured in the quality and depth of relationships of your life, then uh, I am truly a blessed man. So, and particularly so Denise, as you know, is just about all the learning that we've shared over the years through Giant really is a codification of my own personal failure and then finding a way to make it work and then hopefully sharing it uh, with people like you and your audience so that they can make different mistakes from the ones I've already made. So communication code is deeply personal. Um, I think it changed my marriage more than any other uh, tool book we've written. And even Jeremy and I went to another level of uh, partnership in our business actually through the writing and reflecting and creating of the the content for communication code so this is personal i love sharing it i'm honored and i trust that it'll be as helpful to uh, our audience today as it's been to me and i love that you're sharing that i've like i said i've got many of your books i've read every single one of them i love the way you guys write and communicate and there's that word communication It seems to me, and I'm reading in the introduction, and there's a little block here. It says, healthy communication is the exception, not the norm. I don't actually find that to be true, sadly. But I think we can get there if we work at it. Mm. I think what we said was, Denise, is that actually when you look at the health of relationships over the long term, 
that actually making a relationship work long term takes an awful lot of work. Exactly. And we actually look at it, most communication breaks down over time and nobody ever means to. I always say to people, you know, in in years gone by, I was I was a pastor and used to do marriage prep with young, idealistic young couples. And nobody ever sat on my couch hoping that it would end in an acrimonious divorce, fighting over the children and really despising each other. Um, nobody ever set out that way. And yet, sadly, a number of them got there. And we, Jeremy and I, spent a lot of time helping people, I guess, build businesses and build partnerships. And nobody, Denise, ever sits down in that initial consulting period and goes, I hope we end up falling out, fighting over intellectual property and clients and suing each other in the law courts in years to come. But that's sadly the reality in so many uh, relationships. So that's a bold statement. But, do you know, sadly, I think it's actually true that long term healthy communication and relationships is the exception, not the norm. So, you know, hopefully this will help. That's that's interesting because I look at people and and you're right. Nobody wants to start any kind of a relationship right. and say, well, you know, I'm going to give it 10 years after that. I'm out of here. You know, you just, <laughs> yeah. why? But it is, I look around and I watch how people are behaving right now in particular because our world is, in my opinion, under a, a low level sense of chronic dread, everybody's worried about everything that cannot be helpful for long term commitments if you're not mm. paying attention. If you're not taking care uh, of those, those commitments to yourself and to your partners, what you know, business, personal, everybody, if you're not really paying attention. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. I think I think the hardest thing and why it's so painful for people is, A, it's not what people hope would happen. And people try really hard to make relationships work. So there's nothing worse than when you feel like you're trying everything you can and it's still not working. And that's the, the you know, that, that's the, the bit where basically when people resonate with that and then they go, yeah, that's me. I, I, even when I try, it seems to go wrong. And helping people understand what's going on and why, I would say, is at the, the heart of what we're we're trying to share. Because I often say to people, uh, transmission of information is not the same as healthy communication. So just because I transmit words to you, whether that's verbally or in letters or email, whatever it might be, me transmitting information does not guarantee communication has taken place. What has to happen is the person receiving my transmission has to be able to understand the intent with which I shared those words and ultimately the expectations that I have in how I would like them to respond. But most people, Denise, never ever share the intent or the expectations in advance of the transmission of information. And that's usually where that frustration builds up over time. So that's the thing that I always say to people in the beginning is the communication code was designed to basically be able to address the issue, which is most people think they've communicated when, in fact, all they've done is transmitted information. And see, I never thought of it like that. And I think that's a brilliant way to describe it. But go back just a, a moment to what you said when you haven't really signal your intent with this communication how can we solve that issue mm. so i think the moment you the moment you kind of grasp that that's what's happening i mean i'll give you i'll give you a story that makes me look foolish because it's probably the best illustration of what we're talking about so i talk about it as the worst date night ever okay helen my wife is amazing if you met her you'd love her everybody does and I'm thinking, great, we're going out on a date night tonight. Helen is over there. She's just said, Steve, I'm just exhausted. I'm weary. I'm, I'm just really struggling at the moment. I'm not sure whether it's going to be worth going out tonight. And I'm going, well, I'm I'm so sorry. You know, um, tell me, go, give me, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? And Helen then says, well, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. My dad's not well, blah, blah, blah. And, and I just went, this is before we had any of the tools, by the way. I thought, well, this this is great. This is what I do for a living. I help people solve problems. So I, I went into my office. I rolled out my whiteboard, rolled it into the drawing room with the marker pens. 
wrote the three issues that Helena told me were what she was struggling with and began to create visual suggestions of how we could solve those problems. And at that point, Helen's now in tears. And, and she says, she looks at me, and I still remember it. She, she, she says, you have no idea. You don't get me at all. Oh. And I went, I went, no, you're right. You know, you've told me what's wrong. I do this for a living. I'm really trying to help. But somehow I've made it worse. And somehow um, we've not managed to connect at all. Well, I don't get you. It appears you don't get me. And I was only trying to help. This didn't work. And I remember at the time just going like moments when I always say to people is you reach different stages in a relationship with communication. So sometimes we're the hope is we reach realistic expectations of communication. But occasionally we end up at limited. And every now and again, we reach a place called resigned where we go. I don't really know what else I can do because my intent was to help. But the experience for Helen was not that that was helpful at all. And at the time, Denise, we had no means of translating why. Now, of course, oh. now, of course, I know exactly what was going on because Helen was transmitting information, but she didn't give me her expectation and she didn't send a code in advance of her transmission helping me understand how she wanted me to respond. So, you know, ask anything you want. Otherwise, I'll explain the five communication codes and kind of unpack that story. But I hope that earths it for people because I I really wanted communication to work, but I got it fundamentally wrong, even though my intent was good. I have to ask, how did you resolve this? And listen, as a woman, as a no longer married woman, I have to tell you that when a man, I don't care who he is, starts telling me how I can fix something and that wasn't what I was, I was just venting. You know, I don't, don't fix it for me unless it's a flat tire, go fix that. But, you know, just listen. That's all we're really asking for. We don't want you to fix it for, for the most part. But that's why we talk to our girlfriends more than we talk to our, our husbands or our mates. Just so oh, you know. I mean, and again, I look at I look at it now, Denise, and I go, well, it's obvious. Because what had happened was Helen sent a transmission but didn't send a communication code. Right. What Helen was really trying to say was, Steve, I want you to care, which means yes. yep. I just want you to be present with me. What I'm sharing is nothing to do with what the real issues are at all. I don't need you to fix me. I don't really – that the real issues are not what I'm saying anyway – I just want to know that while I'm struggling, the person I love most is prepared to be present with me physically, emotionally, intellectually, not try and solve me and just be with me. Now, had you she said, said so that much at the better time, than I did, I could not have expected <laughs> it like that. But, but you're right. But of, course, but of course, I launched into my default communication code, which is collaboration. So I'm hearing from Helen here's what I'm struggling with. Can you help me? And I go into, of course I can help you. Here's ways that we can make this better because I'm really good at problem solving. So do you see the difference of going, had Helen said, and she sometimes does, Steve, look, we've got a party at the weekend, a full collaboration invited. I want to make sure we make this as good as we can. Helen in her transmission of information is actually communicating to me in a way that gives me clues as to how she wants me to respond. So all of a sudden, care, collaboration, critique is one of them. So sometimes, you know, I'll say to my colleagues, go, this is going to go live later today. If there's anything wrong or grammatically in error in this particular, whatever it is, please, full critique invited. I'd love to be perfect, but I know I'm not. Because if this is going to go live, I'd rather know why it's going to not work. So... Do you see the difference? When I send the communication code in advance of the transmission, I'm actually helping the person understand my expectation and the intent. And it allows them then to respond um, in a way that means I feel they've really heard and engaged with me. Make sense? It really does. And it does require, and I'm listening and I'm writing things down and I've got sticky notes all over this book, 
But it does require that before you open your mouth to put it in the deep south, before you open your mouth, sit down and shut up for a while. Well, in the in the beginning, Denise, yes, I would say so. I mean, yourself. most people, it's a bit like you, you suddenly become aware of your conscious incompetence. Ooh. Most people, most people are unconsciously incompetent at communication. We think we're better at it than we are. And because we usually end up hanging out with people who are like us. And when we hang out with people who are wired like us, we can be accidental, they're accidental, and no one might. But when we're with people who are have different default codes than we do, if we are just accidental, we suddenly become incompetent very quickly. We just don't know why. And that's, you know, another example where the book came from, if you, the story there is Jeremy, Jeremy, my friend is a very, very charismatic entrepreneurial type character. And we were sat in a coffee shop in where I live and Jeremy's like, Steve, I can't wait to have this time with you. I've been working at this particular deal from my past for so long. And, you know, it's a massive moment for me. I'm thrilled. This is what I've agreed. This is the deal. This is how we're going to be able to partner with him into the future. And I remember going, um, just, that's great. Uh, I can see you're really happy with it, but we don't normally agree commercial deals independently of each other. What about this? What about that? Why do we agree this? Is that the right margin? And Jeremy looked at me, Denise, with these kind of puppy dog eyes, and he said, that wasn't what I hoped would happen. <laughs> and, and I went, well, what were you hoping would happen? And he said, in all honesty, Steve, I'd hoped that the person who I'm closest to have worked with for seven years was going to actually celebrate with me some really important milestone in my life. Maybe we're going to crack open a bottle of champagne, have lunch together, and probably not talk about a great deal else over the next hour or so together. And he says, Steve, you celebrated for about three nanoseconds, and then you launched into critique, or at least as he experienced it, of why this was a terrible deal, and I wished he hadn't been so incompetent in what he'd signed and agreed. So that's, believe it or not, Denise, that was the moment the genesis of the communication code was born. Because I said to Jeremy, well, if you told me that you wanted to celebrate with me over a bottle of champagne and lunch, I probably would have lasted a lot longer than I did. But you didn't give me any clues. So therefore, how how was I to know? So you see, by, <laughs> by I, what really happened, I said, well, I was trying to collaborate. You wanted me to celebrate, but what you really experienced for me was critique. And critique, whenever it's experienced as criticism, isn't effective communication because critique only happens well when the person asks specifically for it. It turns out 50% of the population, Denise, by the way, have critique as one of their top two codes by default. So anyone who's a thinker or the rational, logical, analytical, which is 70% of men, by the way, will automatically have critique as part of their default code. That's why it goes wrong in a lot of relationships, um, you know, because in a sense, it's a fundamental miss in expectation. Well, and that makes sense. So I have to ask you, I mean, this sounds like a pretty weighty conversation that you two had over lunch with no champagne. How did you get <laughs> it without stomping off and saying, I'm never talking to you again? Because that's really, Denise, how most of the giant stuff have been created in the past. It was usually Jeremy and I struggling over something, but recognizing that we actually understood that each of us had different superpowers. So Jeremy and Voices is a connector. I'm a pioneer. Um, but together, we always create things that are better than one of us would have come up with on our own. So, of course, I'd been to Bletchley Park the week before for children's half term over here in, in England, which is where the, the code breakers were code in the Second breakers. World War. So right. if you ever seen the imitation game and they cracked the Enigma code, and of course, I love history and, you know, teaching was my previous career. And I said, I just, hey, this may be something very similar as an analogy. You didn't send me the communication code. Therefore, I wasn't able to interpret your transmission. What if we could send a communication code like the Germans did for the day ahead of our transmission 
which would mean that the person receiving it could translate it and understand the intent and the expectations that lay behind it. So by the end of the day, we had all five, critique, collaborate, care, celebrate, and clarify, and actually realized very quickly, if we were consciously competent and actually sent the communication code in advance to the whole team, we actually dramatically changed people's perception of communication and health. Um, and honestly, I use it all the time. Even if somebody doesn't know the communication code, Denise, I'm conscious enough of my own you know, frailties with my grenade launcher to actually sometimes I'll just ask and go, hey, before I respond, what, what are you hoping happens here? Are you, are you just want me to listen and be a, a good friend? Um, do you want to ask good questions to get out of you? What it is you're really trying to say? Are you inviting me to make it better? Do you want me to tell you why it's not going to work? Or do you just want me to cheer, <laughs> open a bottle of champagne and run a parade because it's so awesome? So, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but it gives you an idea of going, I can ask in advance of response, even if they don't know the communication code, because everyone really knows what they hope happens. They just don't normally send it. They just send the words and then wonder why it doesn't go well. And honestly, to me, and I love this part, I just scribbled all kinds of notes because I'm going to be writing an article about this because it's brilliant and thank you. And of course, I'm going to reference you who taught me this, but the thing is we don't often, we're, we're so busy listening and then waiting for our turn to talk that we don't kind of filter through what you just said. What do you need from me? How can I help? Do you need me to just sit and be quiet? Do you need me to solve a problem for you? Do you need, do you need me to go beat somebody up? Oh, what is it? What do you need? <laughs> that, that's not an official communication code, but I like your thinking. <laughs> Here's the thing. Don't get it. You are a more advanced form of the species as a, as an introvert. Anyway, you are wired to listen I and am. only respond when you have something to say. I, however, I'm a less evolved form of Darwinian evolution. And I'm an extrovert who actually is really, sometimes I'll get frustrated that you've taken so long to get it out. I'll finish your sentence just so I can keep talking. So <laughs> if you think, you know, there's I'm that piece in the play as well. I'm picturing that with no champagne. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stuck on that champagne. <laughs> we can always do champagne. Do you know it's it's interesting? We've we've helped so many executive teams, by the way, are full of people who critique all the time because they're just very cerebral and clever. Every company we work with now, we we instigate a discipline of celebration. We do it in our homes, in our family. It, Brits are terrible at it, by the way. We, we 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 celebrate when somebody dies and we say nice things about them at funerals. We've actually learned how to put celebration into the fabric, even at the beginning of a team meeting. So, you know, every organization I know has problems. You know, it's, it's, We're dealing with human beings and variables. But it's amazing if you say, hey, before we launch into our agenda today, I want everyone to think of one thing that they're really proud of excited about what's gone really well in the last seven days and just go around and everybody in the room actually goes hey it was brilliant we did this you know client demo we did xyz we launched new software do you know by the time everyone shared in the team denise the celebration of what's gone really well the moment you then move into we usually ask the second question which is hey is there anyone got anything going on that needs specific uh, extra care today in the sense of is the it, it just let us know if there's something going on at home or whatever it might be so we can be extra sensitive and then we move into the agenda of a meeting where we actually go okay what are we trying to work on what are you asking for is this critique is it collaboration are we making decisions or is this process but the communication code literally you can use anywhere we do it for birthdays uh, when anyone has a birthday we will often gather kind of some of our extended family particularly for the children and part of the evening, we will celebrate them and tell them um, in front of everybody what we most love about them and the character issues that we most appreciate about them. And it's amazing how for kids, they get the hang of it and they become very American or <laughs> un-British in the go, hey, dad, can we do that celebration thing again? Because they've even taken it into school and they've taken it and done it with their friends on their birthdays when they've been out. So I've been very proud of that. But again, everything we built was designed for educated 13 year olds, just so I could understand it. And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's simplistic. 
In fact, sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things to do because we know what we ought to do and we don't. So there you go. Discipline of celebration is something which, um, as a natural critiquer, I've actually seen the power of what happens when we learn to celebrate well. It's not all we do. We use them all. But it's amazing if you're listening to this and you're leading teams or organizations or families, learning to put the discipline of celebration into your rhythms actually will change the culture over time, probably more than anything else I know. It does. And I had to learn that on my own because like you, I'm a critiquer. I don't mean to be. I don't much like that about myself, but it's one of my defaults. And I have to be careful with it. I have to sit down, stop, mm -hmm. think, don't say what you were just going to say. You know, I have to really <laughs> work on that more than you would think. But everything in this book makes perfect sense to me. I am a rational thinker. You know, I'm, I have high mm -hmm. critical thinking skills, I think. Maybe other people don't think it, but they're wrong. I think I'm I I'm sure you do. To I'm sure you do. <laughs> but when I read a book like like this i'm like oh i get it i get it and one of the things that i wanted to ask you is why you believe so strongly that relational intelligence is the most critical factor in leadership because we're talking about leadership leadership is from the ground up whether you're talking to your cat which i'm about to do and tell her to stop yelling at me whether you're a leader in a business whether you are the leader in your home yeah. on tuesdays and thursdays we all have leadership qualities but i think yeah. we don't necessarily know how to critique ourselves i guess is where i'm going it's, so relational intelligence is a phrase we've we've increasingly used because soft skills is the thing which people talk about. Again, no, it's not it's not that. It's actually more important than anyone realizes. The reason being is we are really moving away from the age of the IQ. Now, hear that. It's not that IQ is not important, but if you think of the, the late industrial age, we're really you know, we use people's big brains to process complex analysis and strategy. We're now living in a world where machine learning, AI, processes and computes data at speeds that our human brain has no way of ever competing with. And in a sense, therefore, the, the, the Darwinian advantage in the industrial world of the rational, logical, analytical thinker actually is being replaced I believe in the new world where that's assumed and that actually the we're now in the age where relational intelligence is probably more important than classic raw IQ because the real question is not can you solve all the problems yourself it's can you create a synergistic team environment where people are able to bring their complementary superpowers to the table where you can solve problems that no individual ever can so leaders are having to learn not how to do all the that how to do it themselves they're having to learn how to empower and create environments where people of different ages with different worldviews and you know, all the differentiations that we know actually feel i can bring my best to this table i promise you the ability to calibrate high support and high challenge for each person you lead is an art not a science because they change Things go on in their lives, which means they're different at work today than they were yesterday. So you can't just learn a formula. Uh, you know, we teach a lot that says leaders in the digital world don't need a bigger library. They need a better toolkit. Because in a sense, there is no, there's yeah. no, we've not been to this future before. You know, we're not writing about, hey, this is how AI is shaping the world. We're learning as we go. And ultimately, what we're doing is we're embracing the frontiers of new technology. But ultimately, as leaders, we're having to do that with different people and being able to connect and be relationally intelligent in the way we lead and lead through influence. That I genuinely believe, um, Denise, is a competitive advantage in the new world because you can't just hire a very, very clever person and sell their brain power out for 300 bucks an hour anymore. The world has moved on and we have to deal with our insecurities and our fears at times that, you know, we're, that's not the skills that are as valuable. But any leader 
who is relationally intelligent and is able to get the best out of people and create healthy, sustainable cultures, they, they win every time. Ultimately, anyone who doesn't change will become like the Oxbow Lake. The river will eventually flow around them and they'll either get moved on or the company itself, if they refuse to move, uh, will go as well. So you either embrace the new technology and the entrepreneurial opportunity or um, it will pass you by. And, and that's sadly the reason why I guess as well, people of my age, so I'm 54, 54 two days ago, hope you're impressed. Happy birthday. We were born in a world that, I was born and trained for the late industrial world. And we now live in a digital world. The people who are the most effective at leading the technology in my team in Giant are not people Jeremy and mine's age. If I look at the new app they're building at the moment for Five Voices, it's actually the 20 somethings and the 30 somethings that are building it because that's they're they're native to that world but they love our culture and they love being part of it and they want to be mentored and grown but we don't have to <laughs> we don't have all the answers we actually have to be humble enough to realize that actually there is a a digital native generation coming through who will always be better in the new world than I will be but they're desperate to be mentored and they're desperate to be invested in. And if you do that as a 54 year old, they'll follow you anywhere. So I love being in many ways, a, a leader in the digital world, even though I'm at best in Harry Potter language, a mud blood, and I'm <laughs> never going to be a pure blood who's, who's known nothing else apart from the digital world. My kids, they're digital natives, but it's interesting how that actually requires humility and it really requires a degree of self and others awareness, which again is back to relational intelligence. So there you go. It's a very long answer to a short question. So forgive me, Denise. No, no, I love it. And listen, I pay a lot of attention to what's going on with AI. When it first popped up, I went, Oh, yeah, I'm a web developer. You know, I'm <laughs> you know, I'm always thinking, I'm always doing, I'm always in front of a computer. I love it. And one of the reasons I love it, and it's kind of simple actually, is that it forces me to think i'll create my own prompts i'll toss it in there and all of a sudden i'm having an argument with chat gpt so it's, kind of, <laughs> it's like playing chess I mean, with not a computer it's like i'm gonna win this i never do but it does make me go down different avenues of thought and i really appreciate that yeah i mean the one thing that if you look at history Whenever there is a technological revolution, and it happens like in West, you know, every couple of hundred years, really, whether it's the printing press or the rotary steam engine or, you know, the Internet and whatever it might be. Here's what happens is it creates huge disruption. And people, a lot of people are fearful of the change and they almost try and prevent it happening. So whether they burn the books or smash the factories or pretend the digital world doesn't exist you can't disinvent new technology but there is always an entrepreneurial wild west for about 50 years because nobody knows how to regulate the new world and then they start to level it up but in the meantime there's some incredible winners who see the opportunity embrace with a little bit of fear and trepidation but they own it and they lead it and that's where i think is it is difficult particularly for people over 50 whatever it is who right now are at the age when they should be the master and mistress of all they survey and where they're the ones that are seen as having the answers and you know they've got all the experience well here's the problem we don't <laughs> the new world the most talented people in the digital world are the digital natives not people like me so that's back to my you know mud bloods rather than um but anyone who tries to be a muggle and bury their head in the sand and hope it goes away is going to be very disappointed because you can't disinvent this now regulate it but embrace it and actually ride it and see what opportunities there are i mean you know i'm looking at the new app they're building at the moment for five voices which i'll send you as a prototype denise it is unbelievable how intelligent this thing is it's like Bronson said, Steve, it's like having you answering all my questions all day long. And I'm going, well, if I can do that on an app rather than me have to explain it, I'm thrilled. But all of that is being because we're teaching large language models how to think. And they're coming back to us often with as intelligent, if not more intelligent things than what I would have come out with. So, yeah, I'm 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 loving it, even if part of me is slightly daunted by thinking, gosh, where does this end? And a lot of people who are, I've, you know, I deal with a lot of authors. I love interviewing authors like you and Jeremy. And a lot of authors, oh, they're going to replace us. 
no, no, I don't see it happening like that. For starters, if you are poor in grammar, you've got these great ideas, you've got these wonderful outlines, but your grammar is, eh, it's, it's not persuasive. These yes. models can help you. Punch it up, punch it down. I will often tell chat GPT, calm down, calm down, calm, take it down a bit and it will, but I'm I like, love that. stop it. You know, you're being very flowery. I'm not a flowery person. You don't know me, do you? And off we go. I have a ball with chat. I really do. <laughs> I, I, I agree to a point, but I also agree that the traditional way of writing one book and doing what we're doing now I'm not saying it will go away, but I think I'm at the we're at the edge of evolution with the AI where actually I think you will end up receiving what we're teaching tailored and customized for the way you are wired and the way you'd like to receive it. So, for example, you know, you can choose a course on what we're doing and I don't know, racial intelligence, whatever it is, it will know how you're wired through voices and big five. And what will happen then is it will say, and it does this already, Denise, it says, Steve, how would you like to receive this? Would you like an audio book, an ebook, a podcast, or daily reminders? And I then say, I would like an, I would, I'm, you know, I'm going to go into the gym. I'm going to have time to, to read or whatever it might be. I would like a 10 minute ebook on how do I be more relationally intelligent with my, you know, whatever. And it says, I can do that for you, Steve. It produces a PDF literally in a nanosecond. And it is creating content that is customized to the way I like to learn and writing to me as if it knows me. So I do wonder, Denise, whether actually the communication code is, is amazing. But I suspect that we may get to a point where you may decide how you want to receive that new learning I'm sharing. Do you want an e do you want a book? Do you want an audio book? Do you want a podcast? And how long would you like to receive it for? So I'm watching the evolution of learning, and I think that will disrupt, or at least augment and and make better the learning experience. Well, if you're a real author, my greatest desire, and I hope you can hear it, is. I want you to be able to take and use what it is that I've created so that you can be more intelligent than I am and communicate more effectively in your relationships. And honestly, I don't really mind whether you read a book, listen to a podcast, listen to an audio book, whatever it might be. I want you to receive it in a way that you most find effective for learning and in a way that you feel this content is not just generic for everyone. It's built for you. And that's what's coming. I mean, you know, we, we already have prototypes of this stuff. So watch this space. I think it will change the way we, we read and learn. I agree with you. But I have to tell you, as a lifelong reader, I started reading when I was three. My mom said it was because nobody told me that I couldn't, which I thought was brilliant. And I have thousands of books. They're here. They're in my bedroom. They're in my garage. They're everywhere. I believe you. Oh, but here's the thing about a book. You can pick up a book, and I have one shelf in particular that really is populated with books that I pick up over and over and over again. And mm. what I will find when I pick up a book that, yeah, I need it, or it just pops into, you know, I'll look over and go, oh, I need that book. I will, without fail, find something in the pages of that book that I missed the first time, or I needed it right there at that moment books to me are magical i agree 100 percent with you and if helen was here or even charlie my little one they would say the same thing nothing replaces the book no no but what i would say though is if you look at the attention spans and the way the younger generations are consuming information if you do ask me how many people do i think will really read the communication code from cover to cover as a percentage of the people who will engage with the content. I, I would love to believe it's a lot, but I, I know it's not. And that's the bit where I go, it's not either or, it's both and, but it's really interesting to watch how the way people engage with content. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love sitting down with a book. I, I love marking it up. I love writing in it. Sorry, forgive me. I know you, you know. I, that sacrilege. makes it personal to me. That's sacrilege. You can't do that. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were going to say that. But <laughs> but in principle, it's like, 
it's it's as authors what's our intent our intent is that people that something that we're passionate about actually is made available for more people to use and and that's you know i i want people in relationships in teams in homes to actually be able to communicate more effectively i mean i, I did this keynote um in manchester uh, about uh, three months ago and big conference big sound systems at the back you know when you go to a conference they don't take any chances you, you've got the cameras and at the end of it when i was taking my microphone back to the the guys at the back with all the kind of sounds kit there were three th four actually young asian guys um who said oi mister you know i can't do a, a, a magic can we have a word and i'm like yeah of course you can and the, the first one said to me he said um we just want you to know we sit here every day listening to a lot of people talk and most of it is utter drivel. I won't use the exact word he used because it was uh, rude. He said that we actually listened to what you shared um, and we found it really helpful and challenging. And he said, three of us here reckon we might still be married if we'd heard that two and a half years ago. Oh my. It was like, I was like, wow, there's something in this communication piece because when I told the story of the date night that went wrong, every single one of them was literally going, oh, my goodness, I've done that. It's that bit of going, that's what I'm saying to you. Sometimes it's it's me sharing the struggles to communicate and get better at it allows more people into the story. If someone's really good at communication, they often don't able to empathize with the people, those of us who struggle. So for me, I'm always having to be intentional to be a good listener. I'm always having to be intentional to make sure I've really understood the the expectations and the intent behind transmission of information. So can you see sometimes the things we struggle most with, Denise, are the things we're most effective at helping others with? I think it was Henry Newman, wasn't it? He wrote The Wounded Healer. And he said, you're always, always going to be a much more effective helper and guide when you've already experienced the pain of which you are describing. So, you know, if you'd ask my friends who was the most likely to be an international guru in relational intelligence at the age of 54, none of my friends would have believed it because it was just not true. So, But actually, I think that's part of the reason why I care, because I know the difference it's made, and I've had to apologize to a lot of people. This is such a brilliant conversation. I'm almost speechless. And as you know, that doesn't happen very often. But I wanted to <laughs> to go back to the five crucial conversation codes because we're going to run out of time and I don't want that to happen. Excuse me. We've already talked about critique a good bit, but the five are celebrate, mm -hmm. air, clarify, yep. collaborate. Can you touch on those for me? Yeah, sure. So if, if I'm sending a code in advance to you for collaborate, I'd say, okay, Denise, I'm going to share the best I've got. Um, I think it's really good, but I believe that you can help make it better. So full collaboration invited. Celebrate what's really good about what I've done, but please add your superpowers and expertise to it. So that's collaborate as an invitation. Clarify is when I might say to you, Denise, I know I've got something really important to share, but I don't think it's going to come out exactly as I want it to. So please would you keep asking good clarifying questions until what I'm trying to say is actually come out. And then, then we might go to, cl to collaborate or critique. So clarify is really a request to go, would you do the active listening really well? Because I'm actually going to use you to help get out what I know is a really important idea, but I don't think I'm going to say it well first time. And then you have care, which I, I think I shared a bit earlier, which is, hey, I'm just struggling at the moment. I need a safe place. Please don't judge me on what I say or try and fix me or solve me. Um, actually, what I say is not going to be responsible. Now, every personality, by the way, has a different care. I need care. I need to say to Jeremy, you go, Jeremy, I just need to fire off some frustration grenades because if I do it to them, I'm going to blow them up. And I just, he goes, no, it's fine. So you just fire away. And I might go, oh, I'm so frustrated with so-and-so, you know, and I might get really, really frustrated. I might say some things which are really unhelpful and untrue. And Jeremy knows I doesn't. I don't mean it. It's just I'm practicing to get all the rubbish out. So when I talk to them, it doesn't feel like I'm blowing them up. It feels like I've thought through what it is I'm going to say. So that's what care looks like for me. 
then I think the last one um, was celebrate, which again is is saying, look, I want us to not move on too quickly. There's something really special has happened. Let's take the time to mark it, celebrate it, and make sure that we enjoy a moment. Because there's a lot of us who are highly strategic visionaries that kind of almost reach a hill and then just look for the next one. And if we do that as leaders, we can often wear people out. Sometimes it's just great to go, great job, everyone. We achieved X. It may not have been perfect, but, you know, we're going to actually take the time to celebrate. We're going to make a memory or we're going to do something. It doesn't have to be grand, but it's something which makes a milestone, which says we celebrate when we win things or achieve things or something important happens in our midst. So critique, mm-hmm. clarify, care, celebrate, and um what was the other one? Care, wasn't it? So there's your five communication codes. They're not difficult to understand. I would say to people is to go, everything we built a giant was designed for educated children. So learn the five, try it for a month in your communication. Teach it at home, teach it, uh, teach it at work. And I would say to people is if you use the communication codes for a month and it doesn't dramatically improve the effective communication in the relationships in that arena, you can you can write to me and I will send you a refund happily for any books you bought. It's never happened because what happens is people suddenly go, it wasn't I wanted to miscommunicate or I want I didn't want to hurt you. I just didn't know I was doing it. Now, it doesn't mean I get it right all the time, but it does mean I know why it goes wrong. And as far as I am able, I will try and be careful with my default. So Helen will sometimes say to me, hey, Steve, I know it's not what you're trying to do, but this feels really critical. And I'm, I'm like, oh, in the old days, I'd have gone, well, don't be so ridiculous. I'm trying to help. Now what she's doing is saying, hey, Steve, I was inviting you to collaborate, and now it feels like you're critiquing me. So see the difference? We're actually creating a, a neutral vocabulary language, which means when Helen shares it, I go, oh, oh, I'm sorry. My intent was collaboration. I'm really sorry if it was it was felt like critique. That's not my intent at all. We move on. I love that. And see, my one one of the chapters I keep going back to several times now is about caring. Mm. Listen, so many of us don't. We think, oh, we care, we care. You know, we're going to donate here. We're going to do this. What mm-hmm. I have found is that if I think I'm caring about something, there's a bias somewhere deep inside me and i'm not caring at all i just want it to go away <laughs> yeah. well i think i think what we found things and we write quite a lot about this was that actually the communication codes we use the way we've described but they're also skill sets we can grow in and that's what i like about this it's like i can become better and more effective in using those five codes and so care for me has been a very much a learned behavior but there are lots of practical ways in which I've learned how to care, not the way I would wish to receive it. Because that's usually what happens is we usually do for others what we most want to receive ourselves, and then wonder why it goes wrong. You actually have to learn what care looks like for the other person. And it's amazing how different human beings are. I mean, you know, we've talked before about five voices, but when you overlay five voices with the communication codes, It's literally a way in which you go, not only do I know how you wish me to respond, but I can choose the way I engage with you based on um, the way I know that you would most love to receive it. So, you know, it almost becomes like a superpower and relational intelligence is a bit like the Matrix. If you remember that film, eventually you begin to see the green letters and numbers go down the screen as why people behave the way they do. And once you do that, you can actually be um, an agent of huge good in the world because every broken relationship causes pain and the pain which hurts the most are the relationships that we really hoped would last forever at times and they're the ones where we go i tried everything and it still didn't work and i look back on you know a number of people come and talk to me and go see i realize now that what happened was communication broke down over time and i would say to people is we all get our communication needs met somewhere and people are often uh, physically unfaithful long after they've become 
emotionally and relationally unfaithful because they find people that they connect with them, that they can communicate with, because there's still that deep human need, Denise, to feel like I am heard, valued and appreciated. And when we don't get that in the relationships we hope we would, we eventually move on somewhere else. And what happens is we find someone who's actually wired like us. And all of a sudden, communication becomes easy because we can both be accidental and no, none of the other person doesn't mind. And that makes perfect sense. So I'm back to leadership. And thank you for sharing that. Listen, caring, I, I don't know why I kept going back for that. I've got several mm. colored sticky notes. I have pink for one, one chapter and I've got green for another. They mean things to <laughs> me. But one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that you said is how to care well. And I'm on page 86. Caring well for someone else regarding communication involves several vital aspects. And then you give a whole bunch of tips. So excuse me, I need to cough. Losing my voice. So anybody who grabs this book, and I do suggest that you grab it for your entrepreneurial library and really for your peace of mind. If you can understand or learn how to sit back Think about something before you shoot off the cannon, like you just said, or the grenade. Because I've had to learn that. You know, I'm one of those people. I'm just, if it's top of mind, I'm probably going to say something about it. That's not always a good thing. And I've had to learn that the hard way. But if you will stop <laughs> and train yourself on how to really listen, emotional intelligence mm -hmm. is just IQ. We all have them. But are we using them properly? You know, just... How do we communicate? But mostly, I think, how do you listen? Mm. Yeah, uh, I agree 100%, Denise. I think um, it, it's it's probably the most important skill set for relational intelligence. Um, and you just know people who don't listen well. And it's very rare that you see them be effective in what they're doing. Um and, you know, I think I was probably that person, which is why I'm hoping that, that there are people listening today who will hear this and go, hey, I recognize some of those traits in me. And the encouragement is you can grow in this. You, you really can improve. And the people who love you, when they see you try, it's amazing the grace they give you. Because it's a bit like going before, they just thought you were deliberately being rude, in my case. Now it's like, if I do it, I know I've got it wrong and I apologize quickly. And there's far more grace in the system. Exactly. Steve, before I let you go, and I don't want to because I always love chatting with you. And I do have, you say, most of your books <laughs> and I've got them stacked over there on the important shelf. What do you want people to really know about the work that you're doing and about this book? Um. I, th I think the book is part of a, a toolkit that makes people relationally intelligent. We, we've spent the last 10 years in these realizing that the world we live in today is visual. And so we've codified wisdom into about 50 or so visual tools. Communication code is one of them. Some of them are books, some of them are simple. But it's a bit like going, having spent so long building this thing, through, <laughs> it's almost like we want we want the world to know about it and the world to be able to play. So whether you come in through five voices or communication code or gears, they're all they've all been built really to say, how do we help leaders thrive in the world that is rather than the world that was? So, you know, um fivevoices.com is one. Um you can go and get communication code pretty much anywhere on Amazon. And then there's giantworldwide.com for those of you who are going, hey, I'd love to know how could I use these tools either you know, if you're a coach consultant, use them in your world. Or if you're a, a company and go, hey, I'd really like some of this stuff. I mean, communication code is an amazing keynote, by the way. So I get invited. I love doing keynotes. So if any of you out there and going, hey, this would be great to have you come and speak that. Find me on LinkedIn, reached out. It's one of the things I love doing most with a live audience. Let's talk. Thank you. Let's talk a bit about Giant, because that's how I first met you. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so giant, what is giant? Uh, yeah, I know what it is, but most people are going, what's giant? Sounds interesting. Is it a wizard <laughs> thing? What is it? <laughs> so giant basically is we license intellectual property and technology to independent coaches and consultants who use giants tools and technology with their clients. 
So, you know, Jeremy and I are still really consultants at heart as well. We still have our own clients that we work with because we're always going to do that. But in a sense, what we're doing is we're helping organizations do relationships better. We're helping leaders grow in their capacity to be relationally intelligent and to lead more effectively. And ultimately, how do you lead teams that actually create context where everyone gets to bring their best? You know, so we would say to organizations, how many how many leaders do you have? We call them Sherpas because that was the analogy from the 100X. But how many leaders do you have? Well, they're your most important people because they are defining the subculture so how do you create a way in which all the teams use a common vocabulary language and actually we can track the performance of teams and growth over time? So that's what we do now. Um, it may not have been what we were doing when we were talking to you before, Denise, but that's how we've honed it down to go. We want the world to have access to the tools we've created. We want to help coaches and consultants use it in their world. And um, we're building an app at the moment for Five Voices, which the whole world can use. So that's a bit of a an entrepreneurial play. So watch this space, but that'll probably be April, May before that's out and about. Well, when it is out and about, and I know you're going to send me a, a peek at it, come back and talk about that. Because oh, the I'd love that you're doing to me is just amazing. So, and <laughs> I really, Steve, I so appreciate your company today and every time I get to speak with you. Spending time with you is always a distinct pleasure. And my brain just wanders around for the next, oh, I don't know, six or seven hours going <laughs> zip, zip, zip. I'm going to be very busy thinking today. So bef- go ahead. Well, and- you, do, you do a fantastic job. Oh, uh, it's, it's it's always a pleasure. And I, I hope some of the things we've been able to share today will be, be helpful for um, your audience. And uh, I look forward to hearing from people. So if anyone ever reaches out on LinkedIn, I'll always, I'll always reply uh, because I love it when people say, Hey, I used it and it, it made a difference. So, but thank you for being an amazing host. I, I always love talking to you as well. And I I'd happily come back when the new app's out and we can talk about that. Great. Well, and thank you for sharing where people can find you and, to our audience, as we conclude today's episode, be sure to go back and listen to other conversations that I've had with Steve Cockrum. They're always fascinating. They're always, I want to say they tickle your mind, but they're mind bending in some ways. It's fascinating conversations. So go find Steve on the internet. You can find him on LinkedIn, as he said. You can find him on his different websites. But also, your feedback means a lot to me and to him. So if you found the show helpful, please support us with a quick review on iTunes. Your input is vital in my mission to inspire and empower more individuals. So don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a review, and share your partner in Success Radio with friends. And be sure to find Steve Cochran on the web and go get this book. You don't have to fill it full of sticky notes or index cards, but you should read it. So thank you, everyone. And Steve, again, thank you so much. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.